Hi there. Wow, that was quite an introduction. Uh, Wonder Woman. I've always loved her. Um, <laughs> so yes, I, uh, I am Nikki Fox, and next year I will touch the sun. I'm obviously s speaking figuratively because it's a long way away and I can't afford the bus there. And it's extremely, extremely hot, so um, we're going to be sending a probe. I basically have my perfect job. I, oops, I, um, I dreamt of working for NASA. Um, so I really want to just spend a few minutes and tell you how I actually got from a girl that dreamt of, of looked up at the stars and dreamt of working for NASA to actually doing it. So I grew up in, uh, so actually you're just going to see a quick shot of our spacecraft because she's awfully pretty and she's totally under construction right now. Um, a bit, bit like me, I think. But so, um, so there she is going up to touch the sun. So I grew up in a small market town in England, about 40 miles north of London. Um, my first experience of the sun was uh, finding out it was a star, which I thought was really, really amazing, just like all those other stars. It was actually a star. And that we rotated around it, and the moon rotated around that. And my dad used to inspire me with just, he loved everything about space. He loved the Mercury, the Apollo programs. He followed all of that. Um, he inspired me totally to, to follow my dreams of being a scientist. So I actually think I was, was privileged that I went to an all-girls school, and I know that sounds really strange to you, but because I went to an all-girls school, I never had any stereotypes that girls did one thing and boys did science and math and engineering. That never occurred to me because all my friends were girls, and so we all just did whatever we wanted to do. And so I knew I wanted to be a scientist, but I wasn't quite sure exactly what kind of scientist I wanted to be. So being a scientist, I did it by um, process of elimination. I went to a biology classes, and every time we had to dissect anything, I would pass out. I don't like the sight of blood. So biology and apparently medicine <laughs> were out for me. Um, I then moved on. I thought, what about chemistry? I like mixing things together. Um, but my best friend, uh, I think, may have actually may have had suicidal tendencies, because she would regularly blow up. You know when it would say, heat gently? And she'd whack it up and put it in, it would blow up. And uh, <laughs> she, would, she would leave open the fume cupboard and gas us all and spill concentrated acid. And then she announced, I'm going to go and major in chemistry. And I thought, good God, there's one, there may be another one. So it was far, far, far too dangerous. So I stuck with my idea of doing nice, safe physics. Uh, <laughs> I loved maths, and obviously I loved astronomy. And more than anything, I really liked the idea that you have a theory, and you test it, and you come up with an answer. And often, you come up with more questions. And so I absolutely loved doing physics. So I went to, uh, to Imperial College in London, and I took a degree in physics. At the end of that degree, I thought, well, there aren't very many jobs for people with physics, so maybe I'll go and do a master's in engineering. So I went to the University of Surrey, and I did telecommunications and satellite engineering. And I can honestly say I owe my entire career to the fact that I asked, asked all the wrong questions. I got continually told by all of the professors, you, you think like a scientist, you're not an engineer. Because no offense to engineers in the room. Thank you. Know, you'll be very glad if you see how much I break things that I'm not an engineer. But um, I would ask the wrong questions. I, I didn't care about how something worked. I wanted to know why it worked. And it very quickly became apparent to me that I was no engineer. So I went back to Imperial and I did um, a PhD in space plasma physics. I come to the end of that and I'm thinking, OK, job. And as you can imagine. <laughs> Yes, my parents were very proud. Um, <laughs> as you can imagine, jobs in, it's so easy to apply for jobs in space physics because there are none. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm standing at a conference, and the most amazing, miraculous thing happened to me. A senior scientist walked up to me while I'm giving my poster presentation and said, could I interest you in a job with NASA? So I kind of played it cool. Oh, yeah, am I? <laughs> um, I could probably do that, fit that in my schedule. Uh, whilst inside, I go, yes. Um, so, so, you know, for me, that was huge and amazing. Now, I think maybe for Americans, that might not be so amazing because you grew up with NASA and, you, you know, it's, it's somewhere to work. For me, from a country who hasn't walked on the moon, 
who hasn't sent probes to all those different uh, planets. It was huge and amazing. So I left, and I, I, I left England, and I came to NASA, and I've never looked back. I have an incredibly, incre incredibly privileged life. However, I still feel I'm under construction as the theme of the day. Um, I am a single mom. I have two um, wonderful elementary school children um, who, uh, who love me very much and like me to be here, and I travel a lot. Um, so I'm forever juggling my travel schedule with um, play dates, swimming, a child that was throwing up this morning, um, and uh, you know, pra practicing for a TED talk, traveling to a conference in Germany. And I continually have to balance this. Um, my favorite place to go visit, however, is our clean room at the Applied Physics Lab, where we are building the solar probe. So let me not bore you with my life anymore. Let me tell you about the star of the show, the sun, and indeed, our amazing probe that we are sending there. So a lot of these, these speakers are talking about inspiration. I really feel that space and space travel, space research has inspired people more than almost any other industry. It has been responsible for all of the breakthroughs, all our technology breakthroughs that you have. For example, this particular mission is actually 60 years in the making. It was first proposed in 1958. That's 11 years before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. A group of very, very, very smart people got together, sat in a room, that we call them the Simpson Committee, and they came up with a charter, or those, uh, if you like, a wish list of what are the most amazing things that we would want to do in space. And what do we need a national agency like NASA to do? What can't we do with a single, simple organization? And so they came up with 12 missions. One of those is Solar Probe. There have been many, many incarnations of this amazing mission. Um, we needed to get our technology to where we are today to be able to do this mission. But let me tell you a little bit, oops, about why this, I'm, this is very trigger happy, this. Let's see if we'll go now. No, I want you to see that sun. That's what I want you to see. Okay, let's see if we can get it to move. Yes, okay. This is why I'm not an engineer, folks. Um, so the, you see the sun here. She's very, very active, very beautiful. You're looking at the sun here in ultraviolet. If you look at the sun in it just as you, you know, naked eye visible, it's pretty boring. It's kind of a little spotty surface on there. But when you look at it in ultraviolet, it's really amazing. There are incredible mysteries that are hidden with, within our sun. The first one is the surface of the sun is about 6,000 degrees. As you move away from the sun into that hazy atmosphere that we call the corona, it gets up to about 2 million degrees. That shouldn't happen. It's like water flowing uphill. It shouldn't happen. How on earth can you move away from the source and it gets hotter? And uh, physicists have puzzled this, and um, at least five theories come out every year, but not one of them will actually hold up to the real life. The other thing that happens in the corona, so around the region where it's suddenly heated, it gets accelerated really, really fast. So fast that it can actually break away from the sun's hold and move away from the sun. We call it the solar wind, and it actually bathes all of our planets. So here's our two mysteries. Why is the corona hotter, and why does it suddenly accelerate and move away? And so the only way we can actually study this is to send a probe right up into the sun. We've done an awful lot with amazing views of the sun. These videos that you see all the time, all of these fantastic observations, they're great. I can tell a lot by just looking at you. But I can tell an awful lot more if I come and visit you in your house. So we're going to go up, and we're going to go up and really visit the sun, really up close. So we're actually building the spacecraft now. My role um, is I'm the project scientist for the mission. It's an extremely privileged role. Um, and it means I have to make sure that we can actually return the science that all these people who've been inspired by this mission really want to do. Here you see our wonderful team of engineers. Look how excited and busy they are, don't they? Yeah? <laughs> this is not sped up. This is how fast they work. <laughs> and they are building the spacecraft as we speak um, in, uh, in the clean room just down the road at the Applied Physics Lab. Uh, we will build it, we'll put all the, all the stuff together, we build it, we test it, because it, you can't go up and fix it once it's launched, so we really have to make sure that everything's working. 
Um, I mentioned the technology. So the reason it's taken 60 years for us to be able to do this mission is we've just never been able to do it before. We couldn't send a spacecraft that close to the sun and survive. One of the big um, things that you will see or you, when we show one of the other videos is there's a big heat shield on the front of that spacecraft. The technology alone in that heat shield is mind-blowing and very inspiring. It was a partnership for um, engineers and scientists at APL working with um, folks up here at the Whiting School, JHU Whiting School, um, to come up with this incredible foam. It's, a it's simply carbon. It's a carbon-carbon composite with a foam in the middle, and that is going to protect the spacecraft from the two and a half thousand degrees on one side of the spacecraft. The instruments will be about as warm as you are right now. The rest of the spacecraft will be at room temperature. That kind of technology leap, by the way, I know most of you are not old enough to remember 1958, neither am I, but if you watch some old movies from 1958, you will see that the telephone is actually attached to the wall and it's got one of those weird rotary things that when I show pictures of my kids, they say, what is that, mummy? That's how we used to make phone calls. Now I use my watch to make a phone call or I have this tiny little iPhone that I use. That's the kind of leap that we've had to make in technology to be able to fly it. That's why it's taken us 60 years to get to this point. So if we, uh, we want to go up very close to the sun, as I said, we want to get into that coronal region. Now, um, several of you will be lucky enough, in August this year, there is a total solar eclipse that will be visible from the US. It's the first one in 100 years to be visible from the US. So if you can, go see it. It's amazing and it's inspiring. And I can only imagine what it must have been like before people knew what was happening how frightening it would be when suddenly the sun went out. In the middle of the day, everything went quiet, all the animals went quiet, and you don't know it's going to come back out again. So it's, it's an amazing thing. So the corona is extremely active. It throws off billions of tons of material that are traveling at millions of miles an hour. The place that Solar Probe is going is deep into this region where all this, I like to say, where magic happens, where all this stuff that we don't understand is actually happening. Um, oh. So when, uh, when we get these very big events that come off the, the sun, you will see sunspots, you see big events that come from them called coronal mass ejections. They throw this, this lot of material that comes to our planet and actually impacts it. And some of the beautiful things you can see if you go outside the city, we have had them um, visible from, from Baltimore, but you will see the northern and southern lights. They are tremendously inspiring. In fact, standing underneath an aurora in Sweden when I was a young graduate student inspired me to continue to do uh, what we then called solar terrestrial physics. I also met my husband standing underneath an aurora, so I'm kind of fond of aurora. Um, <laughs> But that not only, um, not only are, are they beautiful, but they can wreak havoc for us down on the planet. When you see an aurora, it's basically like a long current flowing through a wire in the sky over your head. That's fine, except currents have a habit of wanting to close. So if, they c if the ground is not conducting, they will look for something very easy to flow through, like hmm, a power grid where we've already provided the wires for them. And they will go through this power grid and they can cause anything from minor blackouts, brownouts, to, as we saw back in 1989, a complete catastrophic failure of an entire power grid. So we do need to know about these things that are coming towards us so we can better prepare and better understand. And so I will leave you with a shot of our beautiful spacecraft, seeing very clearly there the fantastic heat shield at the front. I mentioned at the very beginning that when the Simpson Committee met, they proposed 12 missions. Solar Probe is the only one that has not yet flown. Not because people aren't interested in it, not because there hasn't been tremendous support, but because we just haven't been able to do it now. But in those 60 years, thousands and thousands and thousands of people have worked to make this dream come true. Technology advances, people's dreams, people's hopes, all ride with this mission. And so I'm very happy to say that finally, next year, July 31st, 2018, from Cape Canaveral, we will launch her.
Thank you very much.